Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you're all enjoying DDD so far. Um, I'm very grateful to be here, so I'd like to thank the organizers and everyone in the community who voted for my talk. Um, the title of this talk is Trust But Verify, Ensuring Data Quality with CI-CD. Um, and let's get started. Cool, so a bit of an overview about what I'm gonna talk, to, uh, talk about today is CI-CD, what it is, uh, types, of, types of testing, sorry, implementation patterns, considerations, and notifications. I understand this talk backs onto lunch, so I'll go as quickly as possible for everyone so we can go get, go get a feed. Um, can I get a show of hands in here who's a data engineer or in the data space currently? The clear minority. Well, this talk is for you guys. <laughs> the software engineers in the room, um, this will be a lot of your bread and butter. Um, so I'm hopefully singing to the choir here. Cool, so what is CICD? Well, it's an acronym that stands for Continuous Integration and Continuous Delivery. Continuous integration is the process of merging working copies of a common project, and continuous delivery um, is the automated testing and deployment of the changes in those working copies. So what does this look like on the ground? Well, for example, maybe you're a data engineer with a DBT project, and you've got several models or tables that you've created that you want to make part of the production uh, project. Similarly, if you've got your infrastructure in code, for example, in Snowflake, um, and you've got some changes that you want to make how can we get those changes into production? How can we get them into the common project? And more importantly, how can we manage that for an entire team? Well, this process is called, uh, you can get it, continuous integration. Woo. <laughs> um, it's not rocket science. A lot of the guesswork for this is already taken away from, uh, from us with things like GitHub, and it generally involves things like a pull request, which is carefully scrutinized and then approved, and it's definitely not commented with looks good to me blindly and approved. Um, and once these changes are pushed into our main branch or our production system or our production, you know, uh, record of the project, uh, something like GitHub Actions, CodeFresh, CircleCI, we'll use YAML to push these changes into our production systems. And that's continuous delivery. Cool. I'm sure you guys all know what this is, so I apologize. I'm just going to refer back to these slides later. Cool. I'm going to go over three types of testing today, end-to-end, non-functional, and data quality. And I'm going to start with end-to-end. So... Say you are a data engineer and you have a big stored procedure that you've inherited from someone else and it's got a lot of implicit uh, domain knowledge and complexity in that SQL. Say one month there's a big refactoring effort and the base tables that this stored procedure pulls from have changed and the underlying data structure has um, been manipulated. And now you've got to change that stored procedure to accom uh, accommodate those changes. So say you spend you know, a couple of weeks figuring out with the team, you, know, you put it together, you think it's working, and you go to the boss at the end of the month and you say, boss, we've done it. We've made a million bucks this month, congrats. And he says, uh, sorry, this is my boss. Um, this is Hamish. Thank you for employing me, Hamish. Um, he says, wow, I'm so happy. Wait a minute, my bank balance is negative. What's going on? Well. I alluded to this in the start of the story, that stored procedure and the changes that we made to it, or I made to it, are uh, not working. <laughs> and um, I've now got to run away on my weekend and try and fix it for him. So one mitigation strategy that you can use to fix uh, problems like this or mitigate these sort of risks is end-to-end -end testing. A better w uh, name for it might be black box testing. And it involves basically mocking your data inputs for a transformation taking the output of that transformation and checking it against what's expected. You can think about this as putting raw ingredients into a system and checking that what comes out the other end is uh, what the customer is after. Um, and if the customer's happy, that's great. And if my boss is happy, that's even better. Because I'm told that's the objective every day. Cool, I'm gonna get to walk through a technical example using PyTest. I think PyTest is great for this sort of thing. It's very versatile and it's also in Python. As I understand, most data engineers know Python quite well along with SQL. I'm also going to have a bit of BDD sprinkled in there. If you don't know what that is, that's behavioral driven development, and that's going to take the form of a Gherkin test. So for those of you who don't know, Gherkin test has uh, the structure of a given, when, and then. Given a certain context, when an action is performed, then I expect this to happen. The example I'm going to walk through is given a user is opted into email and mobile marketing, when they are opted out of email marketing, then they are, opted in, they are opted out of email, but into mobile. Oh, man. Cool, so this is what it can look like in code using the PyTest BDD package. We have our given, when, and then statement. 
Uh, this is our basic setup that I mentioned before. You can think of these as the raw ingredients. Um, and down the bottom there, we are calling our stored procedure with these new test tables, and we're checking that the output is as expected. Zooming in on one of these, you can see that the given statement is our business logic, someone opting into mobile and email marketing. We then have our example data of what that looks like, being pushed into our test environment using a utility function. Um, and if you don't know what a test environment is, well, let me tell you. It's distinct from your development and production environments. Um, it's generally really similar to your production environment. Some people don't have a dev environment, they just have a test environment. But for the sake of this example, we're gonna pretend that our test environment is very close to production and it is used to test things. Shocker. Um, cool, so zooming in on that last step, um, here we are calling that stored procedure with our mocked data. We are running the transformation and checking the outputs against what we're expecting. Uh, upon researching this talk, I've also learned that dbt can be programmatically invoked in Python using CLI commands, so you can actually just point your, so you can point at the dbt project and say run this particular transformation at this environment. And that's another way you can run these tests inside of Python. And I think that's pretty good. Cool, so where does this go in CICD? Um, so I think this is really important uh, to mitigate that risk of people blindly commenting, looks good to me, and approving PRs. It's also really important um, to maintain implicit uh, domain knowledge that's not super obvious in transformations, which is what is lost um, in the process of maintaining them. Um, so PyTest can be used as a required check um, on your PRs. And once that runs, we can confidently say that you know, the, the transformation, what it's supposed to be doing, is still gonna be doing what it's doing. A Couple gotchas that I'd like to mention. Um, first one is using a minus clause in SQL. Um, I've seen this done a couple times. Basically, if you have uh, your rows come out of your test and they're correct, and then you minus what you're expecting to come out of your test, you will be left with zero rows. But really crucially, if your test produces nothing, and you minus the expected output, you'll also get nothing back. So you'll get a, a false positive test. Um, best mitigation strategy for this, and a, and a lot of other issues with writing tests, is watching them fail first, which is a lesson from TDD, but uh, test-driven development, but I understand that a lot of tests in data are written retrospectively, um, but it's really important to watch them fail. Cool, so I'm gonna jump into now non-functional testing. Has this ever happened to you? You make one change to your RBAC or your infrastructure and people start losing access to reports, they can't assume roles. Anyone use the Snowflake Terraform provider in here? No, that's a niche joke, all right. <laughs> um, there's another use case for this. Say you've got a uh, malicious bad actor who's um, trying to grant himself elevated privileges in our data platform, um, or in this case into our RBAC. You can, you can imagine that towards the bottom of that, I'm standing in front of the slides, sorry, I'm in the way. I'll stand over here, cool. So you can imagine that um, this person here is trying to give himself more access basically through a PR and he gets one of his totally trustworthy mates to go and approve that PR. But how do we stop this? How do we lock this down? We don't want people just making random changes to our um, security model or access patterns. Well, one way we can do this is with non-functional testing. This can be used to test things like our access patterns, uh, private data, PII uh, masking, things of this nature. So I'm gonna show you another example with PyTest, um, just with a bit of elbow grease, because this is very bespoke. Um, so this was a shout out in our Slack channel. I believe it was me that raised this PR. That broke the pipeline. <laughs> and it was shouted out in, uh, in our Slack channel because it was, it was on a malicious thing. Uh, let me clarify that. But um, I made a change to our RBAC model without changing the test for it. Um, our pipeline then threw that back and then said, hey, this doesn't match what we're expecting, you need to fix this. So this is what it looks like in code. We now have our RBAC actually defined in our test. There are lots of different ways to do this. I understand that at scale this is actually quite difficult, but in this example we're using it in, in our PyTest. test. Um, then we're going through our hierarchy structure and we're actually checking that all the roles that every particular role inherits from is correct, and if anything doesn't match up, our pipeline will fail. So where does this fit into CI/CD? Well, in the continuous delivery part. So when your GitHub Actions is running after the changes have been pushed to our main branch, um, I think the best place for it is here. You can deploy things to test, and then test your changes, so to speak. Um, and I think that's the best place for it. Uh, big shout out to Brian Yu. I don't think he's here today, but he's an employee, he's a coworker of mine who taught me a lot of what I know and did the code for this test. I'm a big fan of him, so I'd give him a shout out. 
Cool. Last one I'm going to talk about is data quality. So has this ever happened to you? You've got your source system passing data off to your data platform. Data platform passes it off to your reports. People come back with their report and say, what's this, man? This is just null for my profit. A bit upset. Or maybe um, this really sings true for me. Um, maybe you've got an inner join or something like that on um, data that hasn't come in for the month, and your queries are producing no rows. Um, and you're sitting there going, what the hell is going on? I've spent way too much time staring at that in Snowflake or more than I'd like to admit. Um, but one mitigation strategy for this is data quality. And these are checks for things like freshness, so when the last row came through, uh, things like types, and then nulls. This is a more extensive list. The clicker works. Cool. This is a more extensive list, but it's certainly not exhaustive. These are things that I like. Um, I'm going to show you how to do this with Soda. You can also do it in dbt. Um, but the clause with dbt is that you have to already be using dbt, whereas Soda is something you can actually just bolt on this is what a data contract looks like in dbt. So you can see here that these types and nulls are actually enforced in your models.yaml file and your column specifications. Um, data contracts are really cool because they actually won't build the model if the contract is not adhered to, um, whereas data testing and things like Soda retrospectively test what you've been building. This is the configuration for Soda. Please ignore the fact that I've given myself account admin. Um, but this is what it looks like. I think it's pretty cool. Um, they sent me a hoodie, so this is technically sponsored. Um, <laughs> uh, there's your freshness checks, your accepted values. You can also do nulls and whatnot. I think Soda's just so easy to use. That's why I'm recommending it to you. The thing with using stuff like Soda and DBT tests is that um, you don't have to incur like the operational overhead of actually managing your own tests. Of course, when you write your own bespoke tests, you have to manage those tests to make sure they're working correctly. Um, but things like Soda, you don't have to worry. Cool, so where does this fit into CI-CD? Um, it doesn't, uh, I just think it's cool, and I wanted to mention it. Uh, it actually more fits into your production pipeline, and the best use case is that when you don't trust your upstream systems, um, whether that's internal or external, if it's a bit of a dumpster fire, data is a bit of an afterthought, especially for most product teams, and that's because it doesn't actually make the money, at least in the initial stages, so it's kind of just a fact of life. Um, but if we want to have more confidence in our reporting and the transformations that were happening, data quality tests can help ensure that. So in our production pipeline, when these tables are built, we can then run Soda and dbt tests on top of them. And that, I think, is where the magic happens. Cool. Do I really need all of this? That's a fair question. Uh, I think testing is a bit like eating your vegetables. It's one of those things that not everyone's stoked to do, but it's super important. Um, I think it saves time, it stops firefighting, and it builds trust. Um, crucially, I think, like, not crucially, but I think the best anecdote that I've got for it is uh, I trust what I do for the most part. Um, but then again, there's a lot of like implicit domain knowledge that goes into writing SQL transformations that are not going to be obvious to the next person that has to maintain that SQL. And I think that these sort of tests, especially end-to-end -end testing, is crucial in the longevity of that domain knowledge being represented in SQL. Um, data quality and non-functional are kind of just like you know boundaries and uh, flares that are sent up to help mitigate um, other important issues around data. Um, big considerations, I think the big one is time, both yours and the pipeline. Um, when you don't write tests and something goes wrong and you have to troubleshoot, you will spend more time troubleshooting it than the test will take to run. Um, vice versa, if you have PR checks that take 20 minutes, no one really likes that. It's a long feedback loop to make sure everything's working. Um, but you know, it's, it's got to be specific to your needs. There's a balance to be found. And like all good consultants, I've got to say it depends or whatever. Um, ensuring tests are correct is also super important, especially the ones that you are, I'm talking about the ones you, you write that are bespoke. Watching that stuff fail, I think, is crucial. Um, and it, uh, it's just a good, yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, last thing I'm going to talk about is notifications. There's two things that I wanted to talk about with notifications. Um, they are what you should be notified of and how. Um, this is not rocket science, I just think it's worth mentioning. End-to-end um, -end testing on PRs, probably not. Um, the person writing the PRs is generally the one that's worried about those tests passing, so you don't want to be telling the rest of the company that they're failing. Um, I think non-functional testing, that should definitely raise a flare. Um, things like your RBAC being manipulated are definitely something that should be posted elsewhere, even though it might not be malicious. I just think it's important. Um, same for data quality testing. Generally getting upstream teams, whether it's external or internal, to help you out with data quality issues that are on their end. 
getting that ball rolling as early as possible, I think is super important. So being able to flag that or flag those issues as like when they happen is crucial in uh, making that or getting that ball rolling and making sure that process is as fast as possible. Um, it's very easy for this to happen though, notification fatigue. Um, just be smart about how you're notifying your teams. Um, best, best way I can uh, say this is, say you've got Fivetran pulling data into Snowflake, and then you've got DBT running uh, transformations on that data. If Fivetran blows up, I want to know about Fivetran blowing up. I don't want to know about DBT and every dependency in DBT blowing up. Um, but it's easy to happen. I've, got, I've seen Slack uh, channels being muted because of this. Um, it's just really important to try and figure that out. <laughs> uh, but it's bespoke to your company, so I can't really uh, advise on that. Um, also, how you should be notified. Slack and Teams. I think email is a bit of a joke to engineers these days. I don't see anyone checking them anymore. Uh, so I think Slack and Teams are super important. People get a bit iffy about integrations or Git projects with low amount of stars, but both Slack and Teams accept post requests. So I still think they're great. Um, cool, yeah, those are post requests. Wrapping up, testing, good. It's like eating your vegetables. End-to-end, non-functional data quality, I think is super crucial in data. Um, notifications, I think, should go through Teams and Slack, as I just mentioned. The biggest consideration, I think, is your time and the pipelines. Cool. That's it. I'm Matthew. I work for Mechanical Rock. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks for that, that was really awesome. Um, I've got a question about testing SQL. I think you kind of like, there's a pretty big step from an input and an output, and there's oh, yeah. a whole bunch of SQL in the middle. Have you got any thoughts on testing it more detailed? In more detail. Um, so I guess it, it depends on the form that you've got your SQL. So I talked a lot about test, uh, stored procedures, because stored procedures are, depending on how you've got them set up, are relatively easier to test. For example, if you have a stored procedure that takes in each of the tables that it uses, and then uh, can also take the output table that it's posting to. That's how I've set them up. Um, it makes it a lot easier to test because you can just swap out those raw tables in the stored procedures parameters. Um, I understand that that's a big refactor. That's a bit of a refactor to do that. Um, things like DBT can help because I know that you can swap out um, the target destination. And if you have your test environment set up such that the infrastructure and tables and schemas are all the same. If you change the data and run your tests on that data, um, that can also help test your SQL that's in dbt. Does that answer your question? Thank you. We have one more question. Sure. <laughs> that's, um, yeah, really, really um, great speech. That was lots of useful stuff. Um, one thing that uh, often is a challenge is with testing the data, whether you're using production data or, or you know, synthetic sort of dummy test data. Yeah. And what are the considerations and um, trade-offs, I suppose, with that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so testing uh, production versus dummy data. So things like end-to-end uh, -end testing, for example, with complex business logic, the tests that I've implemented have come from um, behavioral driven development example mapping sessions. So software engineers will know this, you come out with a bunch of like quite rigorous test cases that inform the functionality of your app. So I think in the context of data, um, writing tests for that particular, or those sort of particular business logic steps, I think uh, that can be mock data for sure, but data quality keyly needs to be run on your production data. That's like, kind of the whole point, right? <laughs> it's, got, it's got your production data, uh, you need to know that the quality of that is correct. And you can't mock um, like edge cases of production data being incorrect. Um, but yeah, I think end-to-end -end testing, mock data for the most part. Uh, data quality testing, production data. Cool. Any more questions? We're all hungry, aren't we? Hmm? <laughs> Great. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>